Good morning, saints. Ah, uh, yeah, it's going to migrate toward the front center. That's it. Over the past almost 10 years, the Lord has been very gracious to us. In good times and in bad, he is there. When David was running from his son or running from Saul, or he's always running from somebody, he had, <laughs> he had hard times. But he always turned to God because he knew he'd be there. So let's all stand, and I'll read from Psalm 71. Please stand. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. This is the word of God. Yes, indeed. Our God has us. He protects us, He keeps us, and let us find ourselves at rest in His refuge. God hath will 
His truth to triumph through us. Sing with confidence. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Give 
trust God's promises. In Psalm 51, 16, and 17, his word declares, for you, for you, O God, will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of our God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And in Romans 10, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Philippians 1.6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And we don't often see these promises being fulfilled. We also sang for God to give us ears to hear and eyes to see and to help us in our sin, the sin of doubt, the sin of unbelief. And we do ask for that as we await to see God doing what he's promised he's going to do. We wait. And uh, this next song is an encouragement, a prayer to commit ourselves to waiting as we long to see God do what he's promised he's going to do. And this is the, uh, the chorus. And we're going to sing, I will wait for you. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Sing out of the depths. 
Out of the depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. For you to count. For you to count my sinful ways. How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Put your hope in God. So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in His power to save. Completely and forever one. By Christ emerging from the grave. I will wait for you. I will
Savior. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the What a blessing that we have a God who is mighty to save. Amen, church? If you could go ahead and just move to the center aisle, that will create some space for others to grab a seat on the uh, the outside chairs there. That would be a, a huge blessing. As you do that, I just want you to know that now we're moving to a time of our our service where we uh, worship the Lord through giving offerings and also receiving communion. Uh, But before we do that, we always like to take a moment and to welcome those of you who are are new or who are newer uh, and are are joining us this morning. Uh, We want you to know that we are a church that is, is thankful to the Lord to have you here with us this morning. Uh, If it's your first time, then we praise God for you coming to be with us this morning. 
We understand that you could be in a lot of different places this morning, uh, but you have decided to be here, and by God's grace and sovereign hand, you have also uh, showed up here, and we count that a, a blessing to the Lord. And it's our hope that you will be encouraged, that you will be loved, uh, and that, that you will be uh, uh, encouraged to follow the Lord Jesus and to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We often say here that we, we love you enough to tell you the truth about Jesus. Uh, and so we seek to stand on the word of God and proclaim it w- with no shame. We are sinners. God is holy. We need forgiveness. Just as we just sang, we need compassion and forgiveness from God and from one another. And that hope that we have is that in the gospel, we receive exactly that because our Savior died and conquered the grave. Amen. Uh, so if you're new, we're glad you're here, uh, and we hope that you uh, would, would come again and find that we are a place that will help you follow Jesus and help you to help others follow Jesus as well. Uh, in a moment, we're going to have communion um, elements passed uh, through the aisles. Um, you'll ha- there'll be two cups stacked on top of each other with the, uh, with the bread in the bottom and the juice on the top. And we invite you, if you are a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, to partake of communion this morning. But before we do that, let's spend a few moments together in prayer. This prayer is based off of Psalm 130, which we just sang. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we don't take it for granted that we get to call on your name We don't take it for granted, Lord, that we can call you Father. And we recognize, Lord, that the only reason we can do that with any confidence is because you sent your Son to redeem us, Lord. Lord, we are sinful. We are sinners, Lord. And out of the depths of our sins, Lord, when we heard your gospel, we cried to you for mercy. Lord, we understand that if you were to mark or count our iniquities against us, that none of us could stand. But with you, there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. Lord, we, none of us have, have, have sought to keep your commandments in order that we might earn your forgiveness. We know, Lord, that that would be utterly foolish. Our only hope, Lord, is that you are a God who is gracious and merciful and kind, who is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and a God who is willing to blot out and to forgive and to to wipe away and to atone and to redeem us from all of our iniquities, sins, and transgressions. And we thank you that you have given that redemption to us in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would make us a holy, pure, blameless church. Lord, we pray that you would purify us and prune us that we might bear more fruit for you. And we come now, Lord, knowing that you are the one who created all, the one who sustains all, knowing that you are the one who who can give life and take it, Lord, knowing that you are the one who can heal, Lord, we lift up our sick to you. We pray, Father, that you would heal our brother uh, Mark Akers, Lord. We pray for Ray Peterson as well, Father. Please heal both of these brothers. As week after week, day after day, Lord, we lift our voices and ask for, with pleas of mercy to you, Lord, would you be merciful, Lord, and bless and heal them, O God. And Father, we pray for baby Drew Damasa, Lord, and her seizures. Lord, would you please just shower her with mercy, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would hear our cries and answer, O Lord, and mercifully rescue this child, Lord. We pray, Father, also for Magda's upcoming surgery, that it would go well, Lord. We ask that you would bless our sister. And Lord, we 
also run to you as our provider, Lord, knowing that you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. We pray, Father, that you would provide for us new space as we're outgrowing this one. We plead with you to go before us and lead us and guide us into the next step in this church's life. We thank you so much for how you've already provided for us, and we seek your help for the next step, Lord. God, may you also help our, help our church, Lord, to serve you faithfully, to welcome others into our lives, to consider others' interests above our own, and Lord, that we would uh, embody the gospel, that we, would, that we would be representatives of your son, and that we would proclaim your son, Lord. Lord, make us a, a grateful congregation, a humble congregation. Lord, the, the fact that you've entrusted us with this good news of your son is an incredible stewardship that you've given to us, Lord. May we be faithful to do the work that you have called us to, Lord, and be ministers of reconciliation, pleading with a lost world to be reconciled to God. Father, we also just want to have a moment, Lord, to thank you for the birth of Isaiah Owen Tingle. Thank you so much, Lord, for this precious child that's been born to Robert and Shauna. Lord, we ask that you would bless them as they care for their newborn son. And Lord, in this amazing season of having a newborn, would you give them rest? Would you allow them to fully enjoy that season? Uh, and Lord, we, we, we pray, Father, for, uh, for Isaiah, Lord, that he would grow to be a godly man, uh, that he would fear you and love you, Lord. And we pray that you'd help his parents, Lord, to raise him in the teaching and admonition of the Lord. Father, we thank you for, for, for all of these things. And we ask that you would make us a church that devotes ourselves to good works, that we would help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. And we pray, Lord, lastly, that you would strengthen and encourage every soul in this local church. Your word says that this is the one to whom you will look, the one who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at your word. Lord, may every single one of us, Lord, tremble at your word, knowing, God, that you are to be honored, you are to be obeyed, and you are, Lord, to be feared. Each of us, Lord, will have to stand and give an account to you. And we're all relying on your forgiveness and grace through Christ. And as Psalm 130 mentions, there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So Lord, would you help us to keep your commandments and work out our salvation with fear and trembling? And may you help our church, Lord, to grow in that task that we are walking side by side, striving together to keep your word, to honor you and to glorify you and to wait for you. Please bless this time as we reflect on the communion elements, Lord. May we confess our sins to you now as well as we wait for those elements to come to us, knowing that you are righteous and just to forgive us when we confess and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read for us Psalm 130. We've sang it. We've prayed some of it, but I'll read it for us now. It's a Psalm of David. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? But 
With you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. It's three things that this psalm reminds us of that I want to draw our attention to as we hold uh, the elements that, that speak of our Lord's life given for us. And that's, first of all, the reason that he did that. And that is the sinfulness of man. This passage makes it very clear that every single one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. David says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? There is a coming day when we will have to give an account to the Lord for our lives, for the way that we have lived, for every single sin. And if, if our sins are, are kept and held accounted and are counted to us, if, if they are marked against us, then there is no possible way for any of us to stand, but all to shrink back and to fall and to be ashamed all deserving to hear, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? David knows his own sin. David knows the sins of those around him, that that each and every single man is sinful and needs forgiveness. But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And so we see the sinfulness of man, but we see that that sinfulness is not the end of the story. There's also the fact that God is holy and that he, he must punish sin and that he will punish sin. But then how do, we, how, how do we sinful people stand before a holy God with any hope? And this brings to the third item in this psalm. And that is the certainty of our hope. The hope is this, that with the Lord there is forgiveness. The hope is this, that with the Lord there is steadfast love. The hope is this, that with him is plentiful redemption. And the hope is this, that He will redeem us from all our iniquities. David says here that he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And we know that Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to do exactly that. He lived a perfect life. He laid down his life as an atoning sacrifice to redeem us from our sins. And he was raised from the grave on the third day. The sacrifice that he made was accepted by the Father. And he ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father. So that all who have turned from their sin and put their faith and hope in Jesus Christ would know the steadfast love, plentiful redemption, and have assurance that all their iniquities have been redeemed. That's what those elements in your hands remind us of. The sinfulness of man, the holiness of God, and also the certainty of our hope that we have a God of steadfast love, plentiful redemption, who has given his son to pay our ransom and to pay for all our iniquities. I love how in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says that in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Are you thankful for the grace of God? Are you thankful for the steadfast love of the Lord? Are you thankful that he is a God who has provided plenteous redemption and that he redeems us from all our iniquities? That's exactly what we need. That's exactly 
what he and his steadfast love has provided for us and for all who will humble themselves and call on the name of the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, church. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup, church. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we're humbled, Lord, by your grace. We're humbled by your love, your steadfast love that you have shown us through giving your son for us to redeem us. Lord Jesus, you came to seek and save the lost. You came to offer your life as a ransom for many. And so, Lord, we rejoice. We rejoice that our sin that the enemy, the devil, Satan, we rejoice that, that neither of them have dominion over us anymore, that death no longer has dominion over us anymore, Lord, but that you have set us free and you have given us eternal life and a full assurance of forgiveness of sins through your shed blood. We praise you for this great redemption. That not just one sin, or a hundred sins, or ten thousand sins, or not just the sins before we were Christians, Lord, but literally every sin, all of our iniquities, Lord, you have paid for, for us in your great love. So we thank you and we praise you for that, God. We can do nothing else but thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, may we, with such gratitude then, seek knowing what, we, what has been given to us, what a gracious gift of salvation that we have, Lord. May we, may we tremble before you and walk in obedience to you, O oh God. We thank you, Father. Help the church to do that, we ask now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. We're going to meet and greet one another, and you can uh, drop off your kids to class at this time. So go ahead and stand up and meet and greet the person next to you, and tell that person to hope in the Lord. All right, all right, if I can have you make your way back to the sanctuary. Come on in, make your way back to the sanctuary and grab a seat, please. As we continue our worship service. First things first, you heard it in the pastoral prayer, but we can go ahead and praise the Lord for the birth of Isaiah Owen Tingle, amen. Praise God. Lord willing, over the next many months, we'll have multiple announcements such as this, and we'll be able to praise the Lord for continuing to grow his church by various means. Uh, another announcement, no Monday night women's Bible study tomorrow. No Monday night women's Bible study tomorrow. And one that you are all excited about. Next week, we're going to partake in the church picnic. Yeah. Yeah, so right after church, we won't be eating out back. We'll go over to Lomita Park. If your last name is from A to M, we're asking that you bring a side dish. And if your last name is from N to Z, we are asking that you bring a dessert. Lots, here's what it says, lots of volunteers needed. That's nothing new for this church. We praise the Lord for your service and your ministry to one another. So see Mike Koval or Penny Ross for that. And before we sing another song of worship and receive the preaching of God's word, we do have one final announcement. And this announcement is a church family matter for only those gathered here on site today. And so if you're joining us online, we're going to go offline for approximately 20 minutes, and we will 
return. for the Lord. Let us do so now. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us Shape and fashion us in your likeness That the light of Christ might be seen today In our acts of love and our deeds of faith Speak, O Lord and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us. Teach us, Lord, full Get your Bibles and open to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. I've entitled this sermon, A Lament. Um, just for you to know, uh, 
The sermon was, the psalm was chosen about six weeks ago. So I believe God has sovereignly brought us to this place today to hear his word. Psalm chapter 12. This is the word of God. It is true. It is right. It is pure. It is the rock solid foundation upon which we stand. To the choir master, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast, those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Lord, we come to you and your word today with heavy arms. as we've sung in song and begged you, speak to us. Speak to us, O God. Speak to us today. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 12 is a communal lament written by David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is the cry of the anointed king as he despairs the desperate situation that he finds himself in. Possibly it was penned during the rebellion and betrayal of Absalom, his son, and the attempted overthrow of his kingdom. Or it could have been written also as a complaint living during the ungodly rule of King Saul. David cries out his lament. When the culture corrodes, the godly groan. When the culture corrodes, the godly are grieved and they groan. Charles Spurgeon said of this passage that we should bewail our current situation. When the culture is corroded, when the faithful are abandoning the faith, when the psalmist is surrounded by liars and flatterers and prowlers and the vile, where does he turn? Where can we turn? Where do we cry? We cry along with the psalmist. Save, O Lord. Save, O Lord. As we survey Psalm 12 today, we'll see three elements here. The wicked, the righteous, the Lord. As we examine each of their attributes, may the Lord convict 
confirm and encourage us in our own time of desperation. So let's look at point number one, the wicked, the attributes of the wicked. Verse two, everyone utters lies to his neighbor. One of the first attributes of the wicked is they lie. They lie. The psalmist says everyone, everyone, he looks around and he sees them all lying to their neighbors. Falsehood is the norm for the wicked. Psalm 5, 9, for there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. The psalmist so profoundly and, and, and in such incredible picturesque language shows that when the mouth opens, only putridness spews forth, lies and corruption. Also, they flatter with their tongue. 2a says, with flattering lips, they speak. The wicked lie, the wicked flatter. What does it mean to flatter? They, they say whatever you want to hear. Like the adulterous woman in Proverbs 5, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood. Her feet go down to death. The flattering lips of the wicked saying what you want to hear, like the adulterous woman speaking lies, saying no one's going to find out, no one will know, my husband is away, he'll never find out, you'll never be caught, just telling you everything you want to hear. They lie, they flatter, they have a double heart. Their heart is not pure. It is not devoted. It is divided. They are double-minded, unstable in all they do. They're not anchored to the Word of God. They're, they're drifting. There is no devotion there. A heart that has, in separate compartments, one life and another life. And those two never meet. Single-hearted devotion is what we're called to, not double-heartedness. They are proud. Verse 3 and 4. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast. Those who say, with our, with our tongues we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? It's the, it's the, it's the epitome of pride. That they're saying that, that these lips that they did not create, this tongue that they did not create, that they are master over it. They have mastery over their whole self, their body, their heart. And they deny the sovereign God who created those lips, who created that tongue. I teach reading, as most of you know, with my children in elementary school. It's with the tongue and with the lips that we, we pronounce words and we phonetically make meaning. And these proud boasters believe that they can say whatever they want and no one will know the better. They are proud. Finally, two more. They prowl. They prowl in verse 8. In verse 8, it says, On every side the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Always on the hunt for evil, looking, lusting, like Satan, seeking who they may devour, always eating, always consuming, but never satisfied. Always eating, always consuming, but never satisfied. Like Edmund in the Chronicles of Nardia, eating the cursed candy, Turkish delight. The more he, he, the more he eats, the hungrier he gets. Sin never satisfies. Hear me, brother, sister, friend. Sin never satisfies. Finally, they exalt vileness. Verse 8 again, as vileness is exalted among the children of men as they prowl, vileness is exalted. We, we only have to pick up the, the newspaper or turn on the television to see 
just coming out of Pride Month, quote unquote Pride Month, vileness being exalted. Those that would stand for righteousness are made fun of, are mocked, are scorned, and those that would exalt vileness are held in high esteem. As we see these attributes in the wicked, how does the righteous one, how does the psalmist David respond? What are the attributes of the righteous? Well, first we see the righteous, they are humble. They are humble. We see that in verse 1, simply beginning, Save, O Lord. Save, O Lord. David knows where to turn for help. He knows he needs help. He knows he is lost. He knows he is struggling. He knows he is helpless. And so he turns to God for help and says, Save, O Lord. That is where we must turn during this time as well. In humility, on our knees, prostrate before the Lord. Save us, O Lord. Help us, O Lord. You alone are the one who saves. They are humble. How else are the righteous? The righteous are grieved. When David sees the the vanishing of the godly, he cries out, Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of men. As he looks around him and he sees faith diminishing, as he sees vileness growing, he is grieved. He doesn't just cluck his tongue and roll his eyes and point and make fun, but he's, he's grieved to see those who are walking away from faithfully following Yahweh. Next, they are angered. Verse 3 is where David begins to pray. He prays to Yahweh. <laughs> and what a prayer. Verse 3. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast. David pleads with the Lord to shut the mouth of the sinful, proud boaster. As he sees the pride, as he sees the lies, as he sees the exaltation of vileness, he responds in in righteous indignation. Stop them, O God. Shut them up from boasting proudly against you, the sovereign creator of the universe. Notice that that David doesn't say, I'm going to cut off the lips of the proud boaster. But he pleads with God to move, to act, to help on God's behalf. The righteous are humble. The righteous are grieved. The righteous are angered. The righteous pray. They plead. They cry. They shout. They call on the name of the Lord. For the righteous know that He is their only help. He is their only help. And so that brings us to our third point, the Lord. The other person in this passage is the Lord himself. How does the Lord respond? The Lord hears. Look at verse 5. Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan. So here, simply, we see that, that God himself hears. He hears the poor's plight those who are poor in spirit, those of us even even now today as we cry out for the Lord because the needy groan, who could be more needy than our congregation right now as we come before God and ask for his help? Because the poor pleaded, uh, plundered, because the needy groan, the Lord hears. Beloved, know that God hears us. He hears our pleads. He hears our cries. He is not sitting up in heaven with his hands folded or his ears or his fingers in his ears stopped up or away somewhere on a business trip. He's listening. He's eager to help his children. The Lord hears our prayers. The Lord acts. 5b. 
Look again, because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. In many ways, a, a, a terrifying phrase. I will get up. I will arise from my throne, from my sovereign throne to act on behalf of my people. It reminds me of teaching my little children and I'm sitting at my teaching chair in my little desk with a few kids around me and I tell the kid over there, hey, you guys need to settle down. And they ignore me a little bit. And I say again, you guys really need to settle down. Listen to Mr. Brian. And they continue to ignore me. And then I arise. <laughs> I stand up. And they go, uh-oh, <laughs> he's standing up. And many times all I have to do is stand up and give a look, a point, or a snap. And they come back to order. How much more the sovereign God of the universe, when he hears our plight, he says, I will now arise. Our third point about our great God, the Lord protects. Look at the next passage. What does he do when he arises? He says, I will place him in the safety for which he longs. He hears the cry. He hears the plead of the righteous one. And he stands up and he comes to bring protection and safety. That is what we long for, isn't it? To be held in the arms of our loving God to be reassured, to remember that He is our Lord, He is our Father. Psalm 55, 18 says, He redeems my soul in safety. Romans 8, 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? The Lord protects. Verse 7 tells us, The Lord preserves. David now speaking and tells the Lord, You will, you will keep us from this generation forever. You will keep us from this generation forever. The Lord will keep his righteous one, the anointed Davidic king, and he will keep his chosen people, his righteous ones. How will he keep them? How will he keep us? By his word. By his word. Look at what the, what the passage says. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times, you, O oh Lord, will keep them. The them that refers to his words. Yes, he will keep us, his people. But here the psalmist is saying, these words that are pure, these words that are like silver, these words that have no dross, no impurity, God himself will keep his words. David likens the words of the Lord to, to the purest silver, refined by fire. As the, as the, as the silver is, is, is fired, as it is heated, the dross or the impurities are come up and it's, they're scraped off, they're taken away. And that's one way to continue to refine that silver. But David says, no, it's not just refined once, it's refined seven times. A number that signifies completion, fullness, or, or per perfection. God's words are the purest words, the true words, in contrast to the wicked's lies and flattery and fluff. God's words are pure. They are true. They are righteous altogether. Psalm 18:30 says, "This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him." Psalm 119, 140, your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. The psalmist says, I've tested your words. I've tested your promise. It's true. It's really, it's really true. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is righteousness forever and your law is true. Proverbs 35. Every word of God proves true. The words of the Lord are pure words. 
like silver refined in a furnace on the ground purified seven times, you, O Lord, will keep them. When the faithful vanish, when wickedness is on the rise, where does David turn? Where do we turn? David remembers the words of the Lord. And we would do well to do just the same. One more encouragement for us as we move toward our close. As brothers and sisters... We must remember that when we look and see the wickedness around us, that we don't just look out to see the wickedness around us. We must look in as well. And follow the example of David, who in Psalm 139, 23, 24 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there are any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Yes, the righteous are grieved. The righteous are angered. The righteous plead. The righteous pray. But may we have the same response to the sin that's in our own hearts. May a sin within ourselves anger us, grieve us, and cause us to pray and confess and cry out to the Lord on our behalfs as well. The words of the Lord are true. The words of the Lord are true. He will keep, keep them. They are pure. He will keep them. In closing, turn with me to Romans, Romans chapter 8. We're going to end by reading these pure words of the Lord to help us during this time. Romans 8, starting with verse 18 to the end of the chapter. The very words we're talking about, the pure words that have been tested, that have been tried, that have been refined like a silver These are these very words, and these words are for us specifically today. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who, for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his promise, to his purpose... For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for ministering to us today in our time of need. Lord, we need you. As we often sing every hour, we need you. We need you right now. We pray for your people. They'll be strengthened, encouraged. We pray that we will continue to hold on to your word. Hold us, Lord. We know that you will because you've promised that you will. You are our God and we are your people. It's in your blessed son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing again. And if you have any needs or concerns, the elders will be here forward. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing on Christ. On Christ the solid. I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my open stay. Yes. 
to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Sing on Christ. Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all of Redeem says, Amen. Amen. God bless you and we'll... See you outside. God bless you.